Get this and get it straight. Crime is a sucker's road, and those who travel it wind up in the gutter of the prison of the grave. There's no other end, but they never learn. Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum, the refreshing, delicious treat that gives you chewing enjoyment, presents for your listening enjoyment Raymond Chandler's most famous character in The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. To make every day more enjoyable, treat yourself often to refreshing, delicious Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. Here's a taste treat you can enjoy indoors, outdoors, at work, or at play. The cool, long-lasting mint flavor refreshes you. The smooth, steady chewing helps keep you fresh and alert. Adds enjoyment to whatever you're doing. Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. Healthful, refreshing, delicious. Now, with Gerald Moore starred as Philip Marlowe, the makers of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum are glad to bring you tonight's exciting story, The Gold Cobra. History. Hi, Mr. Marlowe. Hi, you, kid. Get up while it's hot. Pay for seventh place clothing walls. Hey, mister. Could you please help a blind man? Could you let me have a buck for my first square meal in a week? You mean your first shot in an hour, don't you, Jake? Huh? <laughs> oh, oh, Mr. Marlowe, hi. How are you? Sorry I didn't recognize you. Must be these dark cheaters. Yeah, it must be. How's business, Jake? Oh, I seen better. You too, huh? Yeah, sure. Well, you're just standing around here in front of your office for the fresh air, maybe. No, I... Oh, uh... oh no, don't tell me. That ain't it. I got it. Huh? You're making a rendezvous, a secret meeting, huh? <laughs> no, Jake, I'm just waiting for something. Holy catfish! Look at that jerk out in the middle of traffic. The guy with the suitcase. Getting out of that cab right in the middle of the street. Hey, he's coming this way. And he acts like the guy I'm waiting for, suitcase and all. Here, Jake, here's a starter on that meal. I'll see you. Goodbye. I got gotcha. you. So long, Mr. Marlowe. Thanks a million. Sir, tell me quickly. You're Mr. Marlowe, Philip Marlowe? That's right. You're Roth Wingham? Correct. Mr. Marlowe, is your car nearby? Yeah, right over there. Good. Come, Mr. Marlowe. We've got to get out of here. My very life may be in danger. And have you been seen with me, sir? Yours as well. Quickly, Mr. Marlowe. We must be off. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, this way, Mr. Wingham. My new client was right out of Charles Dickens. But I bit my lip and tried to play it straight. We piled into my car and took off. Mr. Winkham, his owl eyes glued to the rear window, watched and worried hard about whether we were being followed. But finally, he was convinced that we were safe. He relaxed his grip on the suitcase and fumbled for a cigarette. Roth Winkham was maybe 50 and had a large, bald head on a small, well-dressed body that just couldn't sit still. <laughs> also, it was at least three to one that the gentleman had ulcers. He was the type. Keep driving, please, Mr. Barlow, and do watch the rearview mirror. Uh, okay. Now, sir, what exactly did I say to you on the telephone? Well, you wanted me to fly to Chicago tonight with a suitcase that contained an item worth 20,000 bucks, which was earmarked for some museum, right? Oh, yes, the Asheville Museum. Yeah, and you said something about an eccentric here in L.A. who owned the item. That's about all I caught. That and the fact that you were very worried. And I still am. Now, first, Mr. Barlow, a word about the man who uh, was First, finding... Mr. Winkham, a word or two about the item itself, huh? You know, I can't afford to play carrier pigeon without so much as a peak. It's too much like leading with my chin. Now, what is it? A gold cobra. Uh, a gold what? A cobra. A snake, sir. Made of 250 separate links, each some two inches in diameter and each solid gold. Links, huh? That makes the snake flexible like the real thing, is that it? Yeah, precisely. And the cobra's hood, Mr. Marlowe, is spun gold. Oh? Originally, the object was a ceremonial piece that comes from India, from a kingdom that no longer exists. Mordecai Ziff bought it there several years ago. Mordecai Ziff, huh? Yes. He's the eccentric who lives here in L.A.? Well, perhaps intellectual is more the proper term. Oh. He lives near here in the Hollywood Hills, and he is the one who is presenting the cobra to the museum. I see. Well, tell me, what's your connection, Mr. Wickham? I am a friend, Mr. Mallow. Mordecai and I studied together in Europe many years ago. Really? We have remained fast companions through the years, and now that his health is failing, he is a man of 60. I wish very strongly to repay his kindnesses, but I need your help to do it. 
Yeah, well, that brings us to the party following you. Who's that? A creature named Agbar, Mr. Agbar? Mar. Agbar? Yes. He's an East Indian, and he wants the cobra. Badly. That's all I know of him, except, sir, that he has no claim, morally or legally. He's merely a fanatic. Yeah, well, that's not to be sneered at. It's a full-time job. <laughs> Tell me, what does this Akbar look like? Well, he's thin, he's dark skin, dark hair, vicious cold eyes. You'll have to be on the other... Uh, uh, Mr. Barlow, behind us, sir, that taxi cab. We're being followed to get... Drive, drive, sir! You see who it is? No, but it could be Akbar. Try to lose him. That's exactly what I'm trying to do. The Cobra's in the suitcase here, right? No. This suitcase is empty. Oh? The decoy. The gold cobra is in a similar bag that has been checked at the Beachwood Plaza Hotel. Turn again, Mr. Mallow. The cab is getting in. Right. Now, sir, this envelope contains the claim check for the bag, as well as your airline ticket to Chicago. Also, there's a $100 bill included. Oh, oh. And you'll get another one when we meet tomorrow night in Chicago. I'll look for you at the Dearborn Street Station at 8 o'clock. He's still with us, Mr. Mallow. Yeah, and that's a red light ahead. We can't slip through. Then it's time for me to go. And time for Agbar to follow me. Me and the empty bag. Good luck, Mr. Mallow. I'm counting on you, sir. By the time the light had changed, the spry Roth Winkham had already made it to the sidewalk. The empty suitcase conspicuously in hand. And when my rear view mirror showed the cab had given up the chase, I figured the quantity known as Agbar had taken the bait and followed Winkham. All of which made my next stop the check room at the Beachwood Plaza Hotel. Yes, sir, what'll it... Well, hello. Can I be of some assistance, maybe? I wouldn't be surprised. <laughs> but at the moment, I just want my suitcase. Here, honey, it's a black bag. A black bag? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let's see... Here we are. Number four, five, eleven. Number four, five, eleven. Comes out even. Mm. Must be yours, all right. Yeah, it must be. Thanks, baby. Here. Small token of my appre... Oh. What's the matter, handsome? Your wife just waltz in? Uh, no wife. Just trouble. Goodbye, princess. My first glance at the man standing in the hotel entrance was almost enough. A lot of people could have jet black, unruly hair on top of a flyweight build, but very few people had that kind of wild, sparkling eyes. They were reserved for fanatics named Akbar. When he spotted me and started coming in a hurry, it was time for me and the suitcase to head for the nearest exit. I took a side door just beyond the check room, and from there ran the length of the narrow, twisting corridor that led to the rear of the hotel and out to the alley where I'd parked my car. There I ducked behind a pile of trash cans, slipped my hand over the 38 in my shoulder holster, and waited. But after a full minute went by, I figured that it was safe to go to my car. And it would have been if the striking redhead crouched on the seat inside hadn't been holding an also striking pistol. Just made for ladies. Don't bother getting in the car, Mr. Marlowe. In fact, don't do anything but hand over that suitcase. Here, on the seat. Uh, your mind's made up, huh? Definitely. And keep your hands at your sides. Now, let me have those keys you're holding. Come on, toss them here. Yeah. Now, turn around. Thank you. I'm glad you're cooperative. Don't mention it. It's your winning smile. Anything else? Yes. Walk in the direction you're facing. Go on. Walk it is, baby. But first tell me, who do I see for my car? Don't worry. It'll be returned safe and sound. Yeah, what about the suitcase? It's got all the clothes I have in it. Oh, sure. You look so fetching in gold cobra, don't you? Good night, Mr. Marlowe. The shock of fire red hair gunned my car the length of the alley and then swerved on two wheels into the busy street beyond and was gone. I followed to the end of the alley and started walking toward the hotel. And I saw something else. It was Akbar running toward a hack stand. He had also seen my car disappear and that obviously meant that he wanted the first cab in line to take him someplace in a hurry. But the driver was waiting for a fare, which forced him to the only other cab in line. And almost gave me time to get to it. Uh, almost. <clears throat> but not quite. That left only an outside chance that Akbar had tossed an address at the driver before he knew that the cab was taken. Yeah, but it was an outside chance that paid off. <laughs> 
Yeah, sure, give me your address, pal. You know, I had the flag down. I got an old doll inside. Yeah, yeah, listen, fire... friend, this counts. What, what, what was that address? Come on, the right answer's worth ten to you. A saw? The same. Here, here. Oh, no. All right, what was it? Let me think, pal. Come now, on, hold come on, come on. Pal. I got it. Outpost Road, number 818, I think. Yeah, 818 Outpost Road. 818, Hollywood Hills, huh? Uh-huh. You, someone up there you know, pal? Yeah, it could be. Get moving. 818 Outpost but Road. pal, I already told I already you. heard you. There's another ten in it, and let's forget the old doll. Come on, bust the roll. <laughs> Corner mansion there is 800 outposts, so this next job must be it. Whew. Looks like the Taj Mahal joint. Yeah. That plus enough grounds to build a ballpark, grandstand included. I'll get out here, take the driveway on foot. Okay, pal, whatever you say. Hey, you want me to wait? Yeah, you better. No, no, I think I see my own car up there. Yeah, here's the 10, thanks. Okay, pal. So long. Hey, give my love to the Roger, huh? Brother, what a backdrop for a harem. <laughs> Fifty beautiful girls, fifty. Kindly stand just where you are. This rifle is loaded and the safety not on. It was hard to believe. At the top, a genuine African pith helmet, and under that, a pudgy, cherubic, smiling face with red roses for cheeks and dimples, an inch deep. And the rest fit, too. A round little body dressed in a cocky shirt, riding breeches and polished leather boots. Happy of the seven dwarfs and jungle get up. But there the individual is amended because, like everybody else I'd met tonight, his interest was in the cobra exclusively. Now, mister, whoever you are, where is that snake? Have you tried the grass? I understand snakes love it. This is not the time to jest. There's nothing funny about that cobra. Not unless 20,000 bucks happen to tickle your funny bone. For the last time, where is the cobra? The truth. Okay. The truth. Frankly, my friend, I haven't the slightest idea. <clears throat> Honest, I haven't. Happy folded up on one punch like it was built on hinges. I headed for the Taj Mahal on a run. But when I was past my car and had gone the slippery length of a tiled porch that led to a pair of half-open etched glass doors, I slowed to a walk at the sight of a single light that came from a beaded lamp in a room inside. And I came to a full stop. The room was about the size of a basketball court with plush decor that was strictly Far East. An elderly man wearing a bright yellow satin robe and also bright yellow satin turban was stretched out. Glassy eyes staring at the ceiling. The front of his robe an ugly blood stain. Beside him was the lady with the red hair and next to her the suitcase that wouldn't stay put. It was a good time for me and my 38 to announce ourselves. Well, this certainly outclasses the alley, doesn't it, Red? What? And now it's your turn to keep your hands at your sides. Well, what do you want here, Marlowe? Did you kill him? No. Oh, no, I didn't. Believe me, I didn't. I, I hated Mordecai as if, but I, I wouldn't do this. No, of course not. How could I even think of it? You only stick up people in alleys, steal cars, walk off with gold lucky pieces worth 20 grand or better, huh? Marlo, I didn't do this. My gun hasn't even been fired here. Look Don't try it, Red. I'll look when I'm ready. First, I want to make sure the gold cobra is still intact. Of course it is. I never let it out of my hand. We'll see. Stay right where you are, baby. Don't move. I can unlock this with one hand and cover you with the other. Okay. Now we'll know if the cobra's... Look, look out! Marlo, it's real, a cobra! Steady, steady, Red, don't move! No! Oh, baby, you shouldn't have killed the lights. That makes the next move the cobra's... And my gun's worthless. To make every day more enjoyable, treat yourself often to refreshing, delicious Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. The lively, full-bodied, real mint flavor cools your mouth, moistens your throat, freshens your taste. And the chewing itself gives you a little lift, helps you keep going at your best. So for real chewing enjoyment that's refreshing and long-lasting, always keep Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum handy. Healthful, delicious Wrigley's Spearmint Gum will make every day more enjoyable. 
Now with our star, Gerald Moore, the second act of Philip Marlowe and tonight's exciting story, The Gold Cobra. We got one good look at a live cobra rearing up out of the suitcase, its hood distended, flicking its glossy, forked tongue before the only lamp in the room shattered on the floor in a blue flash and total darkness surged in. For an endless moment, there was silence, as soft and thick as black velvet. Then we heard it. The snake was moving. We listened to it crawl slowly out of the suitcase, ease itself across the table and slither to the floor. Marlo. Marlo, it, it's coming toward us. Stand still, baby. Freeze. Don't move a muscle. I, I can't do it, Marlo. It's the only chance. Do you hear me? No matter what happens, don't move. Marlo, I'm... I'm getting dizzy. I'm Hold afraid on. I'm going to pass. No, baby, oh, hang on, I... hang on, I tell you. Now, Red, listen to me, listen to me. Talk. Start talking, don't stop. But talk softly. I... I... Who are you, Red? Tell me. What's your real I... name? Tell me, tell me. I... Abby. Abigail Seaburn. All right, who killed Ziff, Abby? I... Who was it? Come on, answer me, answer me. Keep talking. I don't know, Marlo. I... I told you the truth. Why did you come here to Ziff's place? He swindled my Aunt Marcel out of all her money before she died. Yeah, go ahead. Money that was supposed to come to me. Swindled her how? He, he, he was a mentalist. Yeah. A fake mind reader and fortune teller. He told her lies that made her keep giving him money until there was nothing left. Had a girl. Keep it up, baby. Keep it up. Why did you take that suitcase away from me at the hotel? Answer me, Abby. Think. I, Come on. I spied on Ziff. I found out about the gold cobra. Yeah, go ahead. I knew if, if I once cut my hands on it, I could force Ziff to return the money he tricked my hand out. Keep talking. Oh, Marlo, I, I can't. I can't stand it that awful. Quiet, snake. quiet. It... Listen. There's someone in here. Yeah. Who's there? Who is it? He made it out the door. The cobra struck at him, Marlo. Sounded like it was clear across the room from us. Now, look, Abby. Abby, stay where you are. Don't move. I'm going to see if I can find a light switch on the wall behind us. Stand real still, Abby. You hear anything? No. Oh, hurry, Marlo, please. Believe me, baby, I am. There ought to be a switch here someplace. There's got to be a switch. Yeah. Yeah, here it is. Oh, thank heaven, light again. Where's that cobra? I, I don't see it, Marlo. We'd better spot it. That thing's loaded with sudden death. But it's not here, I tell you. It's gone, my lord, it's gone. Yeah, I guess you're right, for the time being. But in case it comes back, you better keep that gun handy. Where are you going? After the guy who beat it through that door. Right now, it pays to be ahead of the game. But not too far ahead, Abby, do you understand? Oh, yes. At this point, mister, I'll do anything you say. All right, then wait here for me. And keep your eyes open wide. This cobra's not the only killer loose in this joint. <laughs> door opened into a long passageway that offered as much chance to duck for cover as the inside of a loaded cannon barrel. And it was so narrow that if the cobra had found its way out there, it would be within kissing distance when we passed. The hair on my neck remained at rigid attention while I edged along the hall toward a dim light at the end that came from a heavily draped green waiting room. In the center, facing halfway from me, was Akbar a tousle-haired East Indian. His face was even grayer than before, and his hand trembled as he mopped his glistening forehead with a silk handkerchief. When I stepped in, he saw me from the corner of his eye. His face went stony. Only his right hand moved. It dived under his jacket for a weapon, but I brought my gun down hard on the point of his shoulder. <laughs> his arm went limp, and a knife as wicked as the back end of a scorpion bounced across the floor. The dark... You'll pay for this interference. Not on the installment plan, Buster. We're going to settle up right now. How come the live cobra in the suitcase you're so anxious about? A fiendish trick. Yeah, and in the dark, it almost caught you, didn't it? True, but fortune smiled and the cobra missed. Yeah, but fortune's a fickle lady, Buster. Come on, talk it up. Just what are you trying to promote? The return of this sacred gold cobra to its rightful place. The temple of my ancestors in India. The blasphemy perpetrated by Mordecai Ziff will end only in the restoration of the gold cobra. And I am prepared to do whatever I must do 
to accomplish this, even to paying money for it. Or killing? Or killing. Death is transitory and therefore inconsequential. Well, the Homicide Bureau has other ideas, elephant boy. So maybe we better just... I hate to leave you alone, Akbar, but you're better off in the long run. I watched just long enough to see Akbar melt toward the floor. Then I ran back along the narrow corridor to where I'd left Abby. When I stepped in the door, I stopped cold. She was facing me from across the room, her eyes wide with fear, her mouth still twisted from a scream. Directly behind her was an opening in what should have been a blank wall, and inside it, staring out with fixed hypnotic eyes, was a coiled cobra. Only this one was solid, gleaming gold. I started toward Abby, but I stopped again because there was a gun in my back. That's quite far enough, Marlo. Roth Winkham. What is this? You aren't going to like it, Marlo, not one bit. Give me your gun. Give it to me. Get it yourself. I wanted to warn you, Marlo, but he said he'd shoot me. He took my gun, too. Come on, Winkham, why the switch? Believe me, Marlo, when I hired you tonight, I expected a much less bizarre ending to all this. I intended you to be peacefully on your way to Chicago by now, with the gold cobra safely in tow. Still just a favor for a friend, huh? Not exactly. That part was a small lie. Mordecai Ziff was my partner. Your partner? Yes, my dear. When we felt it was time to move east again, I decided to break away from Mordecai and keep the gold cobra for myself, alone. But I needed help. Because a fanatic named Akbar turned up who had his eye on the cobra, too? Get over into that empty car, both of you. Go on, get over there. Move! T- take it easy! No tricks with the pottery, Marlo. You shoved him into Never it. mind. Leave that vase alone. Get back in the corner. So it was you who killed Ziff, huh? I hated him. For every one of a million indignities I've suffered at his hands... As soon as I was sure you'd picked up the gold cobra, I came back here, and I killed him. I just finished it when... When I got here. Yes, young lady. I didn't know about you, but I managed to get out of here before you blundered in with that empty suitcase. Empty suitcase? That's what you think. That's what I mean. There on the table, empty, as it has been from the outset. Just as empty as the decoy I used. Obviously, Mordecai suspected my intentions to steal a gold cobra, after all. It was a bit more than that, Wink. I'm honest. Oh, what a cozy pair of chums you and Ziff must have been. You really don't know what he put in that bag, do you? What are you talking about? Ziff had a surprise all set for you, Winkum. It was Marlo, a... look! The snake, it's coming out of that vase. Holy smoke, Winkum, there's a live cobra behind oh, you. I don't blame you. Listen to me, will you? Marlo. Oh, that's such an old stunt. Stay back. Marlo, it's Wink, coming. Winkum, kill it, I tell you. It's right behind Stop you. Stop it. You're only wasting time. No, no, no. 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 I've bitten. I've bitten. I've bitten. I've bitten. Oh, no. He's out, and it's no help, baby. That thing's still between us and his gun. Get behind me. Get behind me. Back in the corner. Oh, Marlo, we're trapped. We can't get past it. Get Marlo. back, will you? Maybe I can throw my coat over hey. it long enough. Hey, anybody here? What's the matter? Oh, it's the jerk in the pith helmet. Hey, you! Over here! What in the world's going on, anyway? Get over here with that rifle, will you? Hurry! What's the meaning of all the... <gasps> Bertie! Good heavens, my cobra... Kill it, will you? Shoot! Shh, quiet. You're in a spot, folks. No, Fulham. She's got you within striking distance, so don't move. Just stand still. Very still. Come on, Birdie. Birdie, now, now. Come on. Take a look at the end of the rifle, Birdie. See the hole? That's it in the end. Fascinates you, doesn't it? Steady, folks, don't move. Keep looking at the little hole in the rifle, Birdie. That's right. Now back up. Back up. That's the way. Into the sack, Birdie. Little more. Now pull your head in like a good girl. Ha! That does it. Now we've got you safe and sound in the sack. Oh. <clears throat> Whoever you are, brother, you're a genius. Uh, Crumpler's the name, oldest Crumpler. Snakes are my business. The most amazing thing I've ever seen. Yes. The most amazing thing. Oh. Abby. Uh, Abby. Oh, oh, oh. Well, why, she's fainted. Well, what's wrong? Was she bitten? Uh, no, no. But I know what she means. 
Look, if you don't mind, Crumpler, I think I'll... I'll sit down myself. Right here. Well, when the police finally moved in, they gave the degenerate Taj Mahal a long once over, and then we adjourned for more questions and answers to the hospital where Abby Seberg was getting a nerve back and Akbar was nursing the split scalp I'd given him. And while Otis Crumpler and I waited for the word downstairs in the coffee shop, Roth Winkham, my client, was busy dying of cobra venom in spite of Crumpler's best efforts. Well, that's the way it is with cobras, Mr. Marlowe. Sometimes there's just nothing you can do. Sugar? Uh, no, thanks. No. He had it coming, Otis. Oh, both of them did. Mordecai Ziff was a slimy sort, too. You know, he'd been snooping around my snake farm for several days. Oh? And then tonight, when Bertie turned up missing from her cage, I just knew that he was behind it some way. But I couldn't figure why anybody wanted to steal a cobra. You know what I mean? Uh, yeah, yeah, vaguely. Bill! Phil, guess what? What? Oh, Abigail Seberg is well enough for coffee. <laughs> Sit down. Oh, it's better than that. The police think there's a good chance that Akbar will be able to buy the gold cobra and I will get the money. How do you like that? I like it fine. <laughs> Where are we going to spend it? Oh, well, I know a certain kind of snake bite remedy I'd like to try right oh. now. I think we deserve it, mister. It comes in bottles and they, they call it scotch. Oh, no, not whiskey. Oh, oh. oh not for snake bite. Oh, no. No. Oh, that's the very worst thing you could do. You see, it stimulates the heart and makes the blood go faster. And that... And it... that, Mr. Crumpler, is exactly the idea. Come on, Phil. You know, there are many things that can lead to romance. Usually, it's moonlight. Sometimes it's a bit of a song. <laughs> but who ever heard of a snake playing Cupid? Yeah, well, there was a snake in the Garden of Eden. Yeah, but come to think of it, he kicked up quite a fuss. Bill? Hmm? What are you thinking? Uh, snakes. <laughs> what are you thinking? Apples. <laughs> Remember, friends, to make every day more enjoyable, treat yourself often to refreshing, delicious Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. There's lots of cooling, real mint flavor in every stick. And chewing Wrigley's Spearmint helps you keep feeling fresh and alert. You feel better, work better, get more fun out of doing things. So indoors, outdoors, wherever you go, keep some healthful, refreshing Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum handy. To make every day more enjoyable, treat yourself often to delicious Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. The Adventures of Philip Marlowe, presented by Wrigley's Spearmint Gum, bring you Raymond Chandler's most famous character and star, Gerald Moore. Philip Marlowe is produced and directed by Norman MacDonald and written for radio by Robert Mitchell and Gene Levitt. Featured in the cast were Howard McNear, Lynn Allen, Wilms Herbert, Lou Krugman, Bill Lally, and Michael Ann Barrett. The special music is composed and conducted by Richard Arant. The makers of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum hope you enjoyed tonight's adventure of Philip Marlowe and that you're enjoying Wrigley's Spearmint Gum every day. We invite you to be with us next week when Philip Marlowe says, This time I caught a killer on a lonely pelican's roost. It took a fist fight on the sidewalk, a flyway drummer with an ice pick in his back, and a vicious meeting on a yacht to do it. That plus the color of a girl's hair. This is Bob Stevenson speaking, and this is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.